Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our fourth installment for the 2023 iOscar seminar series. My name is Savia Rana, and I'll be producing the show today. And if you haven't already noticed, it is a, our third anniversary. So thank you for your support over the past three years. We can't believe how fast that time flew by. Um, so we have a very exciting and special seminar lined up for you today. Um, we'll have Dr. Jerry Silver joining us today. Um, before we do start, I have a couple of quick reminders. Please hit that like button and share our channel with anyone who's interested in SCI research. Um, as usual, the chat will remain open for the discussion um, throughout the talk. So please feel free to post your questions at any time and they'll be addressed during one Q&A session during the talk and one at the end. Our moderator for today is Chase Taylor from the Warren Lab in Kentucky. So without any further delay, the stage is all yours, Chase. Thank you, Sabia. Uh, our speaker today, Dr. Jerry Silver, is a professor in the Department of Neurosciences at Case Western Uni Reserve University and a leader in the field of spinal cord injury. Specifically, his work investigating the formation and composition of the glial scar following spinal cord injury has had widespread applications, including, but not limited to, stroke, neurodevelopment, and CNS injury repair. Additionally, his work has been fundamental in establishing methods of downregulating and removing axon growth inhibiting chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans following spinal cord injury. Dr. Silver has received many prestigious awards, including the Christopher Reeve Joan Irvine Research Medal and the Ameritech Prize. He has mentored many individuals who have gone and become researchers in this field and served as lead or senior author on more than 160 publications. Finally, Dr. Silver has contributed to my mentoring indirectly as a result of his mentorship of my PI, Dr. Warren Allain, as a postdoc at Case Western Reserve and their later collaborations together as scientists. We appreciate you coming to speak today and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much. Can, can you all see my screen and can you hear me? Because I don't see any faces on the right side of the screen. Am I okay? That looks great, Dr. Silver. All right, wonderful. So today I I'm going to, uh, try to present a lot of material. And so I'm gonna um, talk as fast as I can in the early part, and then I'll slow down a little bit later. I'm gonna introduce you to the idea that chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans are inhibitory and where that idea came from. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, talk about a receptor that we discovered uh, some time ago, almost 20 years now, um, uh, that binds the CSPGs. And then I'm gonna talk about chronic spinal cord injury. And I'll, I'll stop between the introduction and when I get to talking about chronic SCI to take any questions from the, the chat. So let's, let's get right into it. So this, I always start with this slide from Ramon y Cajal, famous Spanish neuroanatomist a long time ago, over hundred years. Uh, but he really described what happens after injury. These are, uh, this is a spinal cord. He did cat, this is a rat. Spinal cord, he made a lesion in the dorsal columns uh, with a knife so, uh, and then he, uh, Looked to see what happened about six weeks later with silver staining. And he cut horizontal sections. These are the dorsal columns. This is the head. There's the tail. This is the dorsal root entry zone. He described a number of interesting phenomena that are still important today. First, uh, he noticed that the axons uh, retract or die backwards. So if the lesion is here, the axons go backwards a bit. Uh, and they, they end as they're retracting with these strange looking uh, dystrophic end balls. He called these retraction clubs because he believed that the, the axon now separated from its uh, cell body uh, will die. And the death of that axon will occur all the way back to a sustaining collateral, which would be way back here to the dorsal entry zone. So Cajal thought these uh, were uh, transient in the white matter, these cut axons. But with more modern staining techniques, we now know that these end balls can persist. They can persist uh, in some individuals for decades and decades. So these axons are separated from their target, no, but nonetheless entrapped within the penumbra of the lesion after they die back. So keep that idea that these axons with these estrophic end ball tips are entrapped in the lesion. And we need to understand the mechanisms that cause that. If we can figure out why they're entrapped or how they're entrapped, maybe we can overcome that. Uh, to uh, maybe force regeneration and, uh, and functional recovery. So I, these are my cartoons I drew about, oh, 30 or 40 years ago now to try to explain some of the mechanisms that people have suggested that cause regeneration failure. One of the oldest is that the glial scar uh, is a physical barrier. 
Uh, the glial scar is made of astrocytes primarily, and they get very dense and stuff that they created a physical barrier to axon regeneration. Uh, Cajal uh, suggested another possibility that there might be a low supply of tropic or trophic molecules or their receptors on the neuron, enough to sustain the axon for a little while, a few weeks, but not much longer. Um, there's another idea that the neuron itself, as it ages, becomes old and tired. So its growth machinery is reduced. It may lack receptors, it may lack transport mechanisms, can't make a very reliable growth cone. So an intrinsic loss of growth potential. Uh, another phenomenon that I got involved with some time ago, earlier than 1990, was that there might be overtly inhibitory molecules, either in the glial scar and or uh, in white matter. Um, you all know the literature about this. The alligators uh, represent uh, inhibitors in myelin. First one discovered was no-go, then there are two others. Martin Schwab, of course, is a pioneer in this idea. Uh, and then there are the sharks here. And the sharks represent the glial scar. And the reason that it's a shark is because the shark is full of a family of molecules in their cartilage called chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans, which we'll, we'll talk a lot, a lot about during this uh, presentation. And then there's finally this cartoon, uh, the beach chair hypothesis. Now, I like it a lot. Uh, there's an NG2 proteoglycan, which is one of the most inhibitory proteoglycans on the beach chair. Keep that in mind. And the dystrophic ending, because it can last for many decades, Maybe it's in some weird synaptic uh, arrangement with some cell type. It has all it needs, basically, to sort of keep it alive. Uh, and it just sits there on the beach chair uh, with all it needs. And I like this hypothesis because it helps explain why the dystrophic axon tip can remain so long. And, and also, um, we have evidence that this is actually what might be going on. So remember the beach chair and the proteoglycans that are present. Now, all of these phenomena may be occurring uh, at one point or another. So we need a multi-pronged approach uh, to uh, talk about what really is involved with regeneration failure. It's very complex. Uh, I drew this guy here, the macrophage with this devilish face. That represents uh, bloodborne macrophages, very important in axonal retraction and dieback, but I'm not gonna talk about that data today. All right, so here's how I got started on proteoglycans as being inhibitory. Uh, in the mid-1980s, before anybody was thinking about this question, I wondered if there might be actual physical or chemical barriers or boundaries, guardrails, so to speak, in the developing brain or spinal cord that might tell axons where not to go. Now, everybody else at that time was very interested in what causes axons to grow where they do. But I was wondering if there might be really important normally developing barriers. And the first place we looked was in the developing spinal cord, here's the central canal, in, in rats, and this region right here that's wedge-shaped is called the roof plate. It's made of radial glial cells, and then there's big, these big, large extracellular lakes, which I thought might be interesting because the dorsal column axons never cross the roof plate while these openings are present. So we saw the openings first, but we didn't know what was inside them. I thought there might be some kind of a inhibitory jelly, and that's what led me to the proteoglycans. So basically, I sent Diane Snow on a mission to find any antibody that can stain the roof plate, and she came up with this one. It's called CS56. Uh, it came around just around 1989, 1990. It stains chondroitin sulfate glycosaminoglycans wherever they are, and they were here in the roof plate only. It was so cool. So these holes were filled with some kind of a jelly containing some kind of proteoglycan. Now, this, if you don't know what proteoglycans are, I'll give you a little bit of a background. Uh, there is a fundamental backbone made of hyaluronic acid or hyaluronan, to which is linked um, the core protein of the proteoglycan, and it's attached long chain disaccharide sugars called glycosaminoglycans. So this is the proteo protein part, the glycan part are long chain disaccharide sugars called GAGs. They come in various flavors, chondroitin, keratin, dermatin, and heparan, we're going to focus mostly on chondroitin because that's what we found here in the roof plate. And it seems to be the most important and most in inhibitory of all the proteoglycans. So we looked in the spinal cord. Uh, we found that these openings contain proteoglycans, but we couldn't, we didn't know if the proteoglycans were critical. There was no experiment we could do. We needed something that was alive. 
And so we turn to the ret developing retina as another model. This is a developing ret retina before the optic nerve fibers have grown. And we see this whole, these spaces again. And interestingly, within these spaces, in a stage later in the retina, the ganglion cell axons always grow towards this region, but never towards the pupil. Why not? Might there be some kind of an inhibitor there? So this is Perry Brittis, who was in the lab at the time, and he looked at the retina over time in whole mounts. And you can see this is a flat mount of the retina at a very early stage of the rat when the retinal ganglion cells, stained with beta tubulin, are first forming. And notice they form kind of a lock and key configuration. Here's a, here's a later stage, E14 and a half. You see the proteoglycans that are in orange are receding, kind of like a wave going back out into the ocean after it's been on the beach. And there are the new ganglion cells forming. And this retinal wave of receding proteoglycans continues until it's almost always gone. Now, the developing retina uh, generates retinal ganglion cells from the center out towards the periphery. It's a beautiful spatial temporal gradient of differentiation. And if you look right here at this interface between where the, the retinal ganglion cells are now sending out their axons, you see that this is a newly formed ganglion cell sending its axon towards the optic nerve, but never towards the pupil, which is out here. That's full of proteoglycan. So this neuron has a choice. Join your buddies who grew before you or enter the proteoglycan, and they never go in this direction towards the pupil. So we did an experiment, and this was the first use of chondroitinase that I know of in, in a living central nervous system tissue. You can keep the eye alive in vitro. Uh, it'll stay alive for several days. It's in a a little orb, the lens is attached. And we thought if proteoglycans were critical in retinal development, we could just soak the living retina in this enzyme to see if the sugars were critical. We had already done some experiments in vitro to suggest that they were. Those were done by uh, Diane Snow. So we treated the living retina with chondroitinase for over a day during the developmental period I just described. And it really mucked about with retinal architecture. It was really amazing. These are control retinal ganglion cells uh, Stand with beta tubulin. They look like glia, the radial. That's another story. These are neurons, not glia. And they send their axons out here in the marginal zone where the proteoglycans were. If you chondroitinase treat the proteoglycans, uh, it just really messes things up. Axons grow in the wrong place. Some grow out of the pupil. There are polarity changes in the neurons, so really major um, um, changes in the retina, all pathological. That was the first demonstration. Uh, of the role of CSPGs in normal brain development, acting perhaps as a barrier. Uh, people didn't believe this story. What's a cartilaginous molecule doing in the central nervous system? This just can't be true. There aren't, it just was not believed. So it took a long time for people to adopt and accept the idea with lots of other people joining the field that proteoglycans were critical. So um, with this in mind, uh, I wondered if these barrier molecules that we believed were very critical in development might reappear after injury in the adult and play some kind of an inhibitory role in preventing regeneration. So just like Cajal, we made lesions in the spinal cord. This is, this is the dorsal horn. And in addition to doing that, to see if proteoglycans were present, which they were, this is the lesion. The proteoglycans are in blue a week after injury. You can see them in blue with the CS56 antibody that we described before, very strong in the center of the lesion, declining in a gradient as you go outward. That's because some of the triggers that come out of the blood that stimulate the astrocytes at first to make this uh, come out of the bleeding uh, vessels in a gradient and they stimulate the astrocytes. One of the important ones is TGF beta, but, but there are likely others. In addition to making the lesion and showing that proteoglycans are present uh, after injury, we did another experiment because don't forget at this time, uh, the idea was that myelin and no-go, MAG, OMGP were the critical inhibitors and the glial scar wasn't important. So Stephen Davies, when he was in the lab as a postdoc, uh, brought uh, a technique called microtransplantation. Basically what this is, is inserting very small numbers of adult neurons, fully adult, these would be sensory neurons, from the green mouse into the adult rat in the degenerating white matter that is made by this lesion. No way 
if we do this, will these axons be able to regenerate? And surprising to us and pretty much the rest of the world was that these adult sensory neurons could send their axons both rostrally and caudally, if we waited a week or so, robustly. Here are the transplanted neurons, fully adult sensory neurons of the mouse in the rat, no cyclosporin, sending robust processes rostrally toward the brainstem and south caudally towards the lesion. Uh, this is very robust hair-like growth at about a millimeter a day. So it challenged the idea that myelin was such a potent inhibitor. But what happens when these axons got to the area of the lesion? So the experiment was that to make a lesion, we would acutely microtransplant. These are mice neurons in the rat, no uh, anti-rejection meds. So we got eight days to work until the nervous system figures out that this is a mouse and then the, the inflammatory system gets rid of them. So we have eight days to work. We put the cells five millimeters rostral to the lesion. So we've got eight days to work. They grow a millimeter a day. They arrive at the lesion at about day five. We got three more days to watch what they do. What do they do? As these regenerating axons from these adult DRGs enter the area of the lesion, they go into, they invade the proteoglycan gradient all the way to the center of the lesion. You can see these interesting green little tips. And these interesting little tips, you see them here, uh, when magnified, look very much like Cajal's dystrophic growth cones. It's remarkable. And they become entrapped within the center of the lesion and they never get past. That's acute plus eight days. If we make the lesion three months old or even nine months old, allow the lesion to mature, it looks different. It has a central part here, very little astrocytes, a penumbra of reactive astrocytes, they're pink, and here are the regenerating axons. Even three months after injury, the white matter still allows for a robust growth. You can wait a year and microtransplant, and they'll still grow in the degenerating white matter, although not quite as well. Now, what do the tips do? They tell us what's inhibiting them by just looking where they stop. Here's one that stopped right in the glial scar, the astrocytic region. Here's another one that stopped. Here's another one. Here's another one. So some of the axons actually stop within the glial scar. However, others, which are probably you know, really strong growers, get all the way to this interface between the glial scar and this central component called the fibrotic scar. And this is where no axons invade. They even make U-turns. So this area is bad, and this area is worse. Right now in my lab, we're studying what's going on at this interface exactly. It's coming up with some really interesting observations. So we're really focused on this. So this is bad. This is worse. So what's going on? Don't forget the axons are entering. So I, I want to talk about one more place where proteoglycans are present uh, and play a role in inhibition. And that's all the so-called perineuronal net. Perineuronal net. A, a network of proteoglycans around a variety of different adult neuronal subtypes uh, throughout the nervous system. The perineuronal net's very high in the cortex. It's present in cerebellum. It's abundant in spinal cord. Here's a cross section. Um, Sue Hockfield really brought this uh, idea of the perineuronal net back again from almost the dead by generating these antibodies to agrican variants, one of the biggest proteoglycans, a typical cartilaginous proteoglycan, clearly in the brain, robustly present in the spinal cord of different types. And if you look at a high magnification of a neuron surrounded by the net, you see these little lacunae. They look like little cocoons. So what's going on here? This is what the net looks like. So there's a boot on there. This paper from Takahashi explains what the net really is. These are boutons from descending supraspinal projections upon ventral horn motor neurons, which is rich in perineuronal net. And every bouton is surrounded by a little astrocyte process. And that astrocyte process is decorated by the net. So the idea, based on our work, is that if proteoglycans in the net stained by WFA in this case, are inhibitory, then if this bouton were denervated because of an accident, some trauma that cut the axon, this bouton that's still alive would have a hard time sprouting across the net 
into this vacated territory. And so this perineuronal net now, largely composed of aggregate, was thought to be another barrier, but not a barrier for regeneration, a barrier for sprouting and plasticity from one synapse to another. So the scar and the net. So what happens after injury uh, to the perineuronal net? Well, it changes. So Warren Allen Lane showed several years ago, if you look at just normal spinal cord, stained with the CS56 antibody, you don't see much staining. It's a little bit brighter than this, but um, this is an extreme example. You could hardly see any staining at all with this antibody. We'll talk about that more. But if you make a lesion at C2 now, and you look at the perineuronal net down here at C4, it just blooms with this antigen. Um, because of the lesion. So we are south of the lesion, which is here. We're looking down here at C4. And so there's an upregulation of some unknown proteoglycan stained by this antibody. It tends to be a particularly inhibitory form, which I'll talk about shortly. So not only do proteoglycans increase around the injury, they also increase in denervated synaptic targets, both rostral and caudal to the injury. So if you're going to get the axons uh, to function again, there are two ways to do it. One, you could regenerate this axon across the lesion or around it through the white matter back to its target in the gray matter. That's frank regeneration. That's one way to bring about functional recovery, regeneration. However, another way, of course, if you have a partial lesion, then it's possible that information right from this neuron, which is equivalent to information from that one, just slightly shifted, could sprout, they could send collaterals into the denervated territory, either themselves or via an interneuron to cross the midline. Of course, now the information is coming from the wrong side of the brain, but let's see if we can figure that out. So this is our typical lesion that we make. It's what Cajal made. Basically, proteoglycans upregulate all over the place, in the lesion, in the net, rostrally and caudally. So proteoglycans are really, really uh, expansive uh, in their upregulation. All right, let me tell you a little bit how proteoglycans work um, and tell you about uh, our receptor. So these are time-lapse movies. It's a time-lapse movie of adult uh, CNS neurons. These are DRGs, I'm sorry, adult sensory neurons growing on laminin. This is sped up about 200 times. Just look at the dynamics of the filopodia and how the growth cones move over time. But they don't get stuck, they don't get stopped, they um, project, protrude and then they come back. That's, that's normal growth on laminin of an adult sensory neuron. So I asked Veronica Tom when she was in the lab to generate a gradient. Why? Because we saw a gradient of proteoglycans in vivo, if you recall. And so maybe that's important, maybe geometry is critical. And so I, I'm a low kind of a technological guy, um, not no high tech. I, I thought, well, maybe we could make a gradient uh, using coffee rings. Um, if you didn't know this, and actually the physics of coffee rings was not really spelled out until about 2011. Um, a coffee ring is a beautiful gradient. If you make it with coffee, you get coffee increasing out in the ring. But if you use proteoglycans like agrican in red in a ring, mixed with growth promoting extracellular matrix molecule, laminin, you get bi-directional gradients in the ring. You get increasing proteoglycan, CSPG, that's the CS56 antibody, this is aggregan going out, and decreasing laminin, less and less green. So you get bi-directional gradients, that's the physics of coffee rings, using laminin, growth promoting, and an inhibitor. The reason we put in laminin to show that Proteoglycans are inhibitory. You need something that's growth promoting to inhibit, to show that this is potent and not just um, something that's uh, barely uh, permissible to axon growth. So we add laminin. Now, when we look at the neurons uh, that we add, we see two phenomena. These are the adult sensory neurons approaching the ring from the outside where laminin is present. When they get to this very sharp interface, kind of like the roof plate during development, the axons all turn, turning behavior. Now we had described that in 1990 uh, in vitro, and you can see it here, this sharp interface 
adult neurons tend to turn, and it doesn't matter what type. However, if you're a neuron that ends up here on the inside of the gradient, and you can sit down and attach to the proteoglycan, these axons now grow into the gradient, just like the axons did in vitro, in vivo, in our microtransplant story. And you get this frayed rug look. And if you look at growth cones now, they come from the inside. A completely different biology develops than what happens at the outer edge. Now the growth cones enter the rim from the inside, and when they get to about the middle, they stop. And they become incredibly in adherent, almost like a fly on fly paper. And I'll show you more of this. And their tips look very much like a Hall's dystrophic end balls. So we finally had a model of the dystrophic axon that looked like the one that develops in vivo. So we were pretty excited about that. All right. Why? Let's ask this question. Why, why do growth cones even enter the gradient? Why don't they just turn away? Why do they even grow in at all? And this changes the way that we think about the way proteic glycans are inhibitory. And we did that by um, mixing various proteic glycans with various adhesion molecules like lamin or fibronectin. And that was all done by Angela Phyllis when she was in the lab, she was a graduate student. We made these um, 90 degree turn stripes. And the reason we made 90 degree turn zigzag stripes is because if an axon makes the turn, right, ar around the bend, it must mean that it, it likes that surface, it prefers that surface, all right? So we mixed agrican, or the NG2 proteoglycan with laminin or fibronectin at various concentrations. So the neuron would sit down. Now here's the important part. If the neuron sits down on the proteoglycan, as it did in the spot gradient, it sends its axon on the proteoglycan, preferably. I'll say that again. When the neuron could sit down on the proteoglycan, this one happens to be NG2, if the balance is right, it sends its axon and becomes addicted to the proteoglycan surface. It will not leave. And you can see that here. Many turns and bends. If the neuron starts here on fibronectin, enters the lane, and makes a turn, it can go off. All right? It can go on and back off. But once on, for a long enough time, it becomes addicted. What's important for the addiction? Is it the proteoglycan or might it be? the laminin. If it, the proteoglycan is critical for this addiction phenomena, then getting rid of the proteoglycan with chondroitinase, digesting it, might free the neuron. And that's exactly what happened. So now these neurons are growing on the spots. They prefer the proteoglycan lane until we chondroitinase treat, we chase treat. Now the axon can come off. It's clearly the proteoglycan, not the laminin or fibronectin that's critical. And that's all quantified here. So, there are, so from crossing from green, green to black, very rare, unless you can draw it in a street, then it's far, far more common. Um, that's here, right? No treatment going from black to green, no problem. They can come back off again. So it's clearly the sugar, addiction. All right, we've talked about molecules in vitro. What are the cell types? in vivo to which the axons are interacting that mimic or mirror the work I just showed you in vitro. So we took a very, very close look at precisely where the end balls were when we made a dorsal column lesion in the rat. So this is a crush injury of the dorsal columns. It's a horizontal section a week later, stained with a variety of antibodies, one to the proteoglycan NG2, another to vimentin, and another the nest to nestin. Markers like this are in stem-like cells, precursor cells. Uh, and our, our thinking was that there might be some kind of a stem-like cell in the lesion. And if you look at the lesion, it's filled with these markers, NG2, vimentin, and nestin. Now what cell type or cell types make this to fill the lesion? So this is the core of the injury site which is kind of spherical. 
And as we get into the dorsal columns, both rostrally and caudally, you get these little long necks, right? It's the same cell type. So the lesion is kind of fishing bobber shaped. When you make a crushed lesion of the dorsal columns, this happens to be in the rad. And if you look very carefully at where the retracting axon tips are, the lesion is here. They've retracted back into the neck. And they sit very closely on the NG2 glia, a purportedly inhibitory proteoglycan. So remember, we just talked about the beach chair and entrapment, and that's where the axons are. This observation was first made by, uh, by Dana McTeague very early on. It took her years to get this paper published. How is it possible that the axon tips prefer the inhibitory proteoglycan? But remember what I just told you about entrapment. Who are these cells? Well, these cells not only make proteoglycan, they make buckets of laminin. They make laminin, they make NG2, they make vimentin, right? And they also make nestin. Who they are is likely to be oligodendrocyte progenitor cells or OPCs. Another cell that makes all these different uh, kinds of proteins or proteoglycans are pericytes. Uh, so there, it, it may be one cell type or another. Um, we believe it's likely that most of these cells are OPCs. And the reason is, if you look very carefully at the end balls that are in, entrapped on with high affinity, these NG2 producing cells, the end balls themselves, those dystrophic endings, have buckets of synaptic markers. And one of them is SD2, a synaptic vesicle marker. I've always wondered if these funny end balls were synaptic-like. And this observation suggests that they are. There are two reasons. One, this is a synaptic protein. And also, the synaptic link between OPCs and neurons has been made by Vittorio Gallo uh, and, and others uh, that have looked at this gliad. Read papers by Dwight Burgles. So normally, axons make synaptic-like contacts with OPCs. Normally, that's a normal job. But here, the OPCs are not where they ought to be. They're right in the lesion. And that's where the axon comes to rest, makes synaptic proteins. There's the beach chair. And we think that's likely to be uh, the OPC. All right. And so the axon's relatively happy. You know, it's got what it needs. It's got laminin. It's, it may have some trophic support. And it just sits there. It's a little funny smile on its face. So to summarize all of this, there's a lesion. The axons get attacked by inflammatory macrophages that drives them backwards, which I didn't talk about, but that's all published. The axons are driven backwards until they hit a population of stem-like cells, either pericytes uh, and or OPCs. Uh, there's synaptic machinery present. There's a proteoglycan upregulation, and they make a little synapse. Uh, and that's where they sit. And I call this synaptic doom. So this is the, this is the mechanism, we believe, that leads to the entrapment, all right, at least at the cellular level. Now, what's causing this adhesion? Who's causing it? What's the molecular mechanism? And we had really no idea for a very long time. We had discovered the inhibitory nature of proteoglycans uh, in, the, in the mid 1980s to the early 90s. And we had not described the receptor for almost 20 years. And fortunately in 2009, I teamed up with John Flanagan, who thought he may have found a receptor. Uh, that was so exciting. It turns out to be protein tyrosine phosphatase sigma, a tyrosine phosphatase. It's a member of three uh, receptors of the so-called LAR family. LAR is the second member. And there's a third one called delta that we don't know very much about. So this is a receptor protein tyrosine phosphatase. It's the sigma variety. It binds very, very tightly to proteoglycans. It's part of the LAR family, which had long been described as a family of receptors that binds heparin sulfate proteoglycans that leads to strong adhesion and synapse formation. So these were synaptic-like receptors thought to bind only to HSPGs uh, playing a role with CSPGs. So that was very, very exciting. And so, so it's a bifunctional receptor, which we'll talk about shortly. Now, I want to explain just one more point before we get into the receptor itself. So these are the three members. 
The ligand, which binds most tightly to PTP sigma, is the sugar, and it's particularly this one called CSE. Now, these glycosaminoglycan disaccharide chains uh, uh, have mixtures of um, rings of carbon that are sulfated at different positions. And it turns out it's the E unit that's sulfated at the four and six position of GALMAC, which is one of the disaccharides. That's the bad guy. Not the others, CSE. It binds very tightly to this receptor. Indeed, it's now thought it might even be just this little four sulfate right here. This one little stupid sulfate can, could be all the problem, not necessarily the six. So something about this four sulfate right on CSE is the, is the bad guy. And it's very rare. It doesn't pop up all the time. But the CS56 antibody sees it beautifully. So it's an upregulation of this. Okay, so the receptor is rare. It pops up after injury. It binds tightly uh, to the receptor. And if you get a knockout of PTP sigma, we showed that these axons can actually cross the rim, which is really exciting. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the receptor, what it does when it's in our coffee ring assay. So now here's a, an adult sensory neuron growing into the ring. And notice as it does, it becomes incredibly stuck. Look how stuck these processes are. It's really remarkable. Hours and hours, they'll just sit there struggling like a fly on fly paper. When they do that, the sticky receptor, sigma, increases in the growth cone as it enters the gradient by almost double. So the sticky receptor is going up. All right, a little bit more about how it works. Remember, I told you that the receptor is bifunctional. It was thought to be an adhesion molecule that binds to HSPGs. HSPGs right, are also present in the injury site, and their um, ligand, the ligand that HSPGs produce is in great abundance. And so because of so much of it, the receptor, PTP sigma, clusters. So it's together, it's clustered or dimerized. That's off, inactive, not sticky. If the receptor sees CSE, which is rare, it's monomer. And when it's monomer, it's on. That means sticky. And the more receptor, the stickier you are. Okay, so it's bifunctional, clustered or non-clustered. An important part of this clustering phenomena is produced by this area on the other side of the membrane called the wedge. Somehow it's involved in this clustering phenomena. That's off. So what we thought we would do to attack the receptor uh, is to fool the receptor into thinking, so to speak. It was talking to HSPGs, which says go, more growth. And we would flood the nervous system basically with wedges. And we would do that with a peptide. So thanks to Brad Lang, Jared Craig, we developed a peptide, all right, to the wedge region of LAR to sigma, and we also had one to delta. And we put a TAT domain on it so the peptide can cross the membrane. So it's a TAT peptide. One to sigma, we call intracellular sigma peptide or ISP. One to LAR, we call ILP. And we use that in our in vitro spot assay to see if we could wake up the growth cone from its synaptic doom. And so we added the peptide to our spot ring assay in various concentrations. And this is our sigma peptide blocking um, peptide. And you can see the growth cones on the rim not getting stuck. So they, they can die back, but they always wake up. And like little ever-ready Energizer bunnies, they just cross the rim. And they go right across. So that's cool. Well, what about in vivo? What happens after spinal cord injury? So what we did was to lesion the spinal cord with the infinite horizon device, which you're all aware of. We hit the spinal cord as hard as we could, 250 KD. It produced animals that were at a score, a walking score of around 10 or so. We, our goal was to wait a day after injury so we could get to the hospital, treat with peptide, and we would give this subcutaneously 
So TAT peptide, we don't need to hit the spinal cord directly. We would deliver it subcutaneously. We had no idea what uh, concentration to use. We, we picked 11, which was our most, we just picked 11. And we gave the peptide for seven weeks. We stopped, we did tests of behavior. We looked at urination. We did another variety of tests. And then finally at the end, we looked at bladder function. And we treated five cohorts of, cohorts of animals with varying degrees, amounts of peptide, uh, mostly at 11. And here's what we found. So when animals are contused, the way we did it, the controls get to a score, walking score of about 10. The ILP, ILP peptide had no effect. But the peptide to the sigma receptor did. At the concentrations that we use the most, which is 11, we saw a very interesting phenomena. One, we had responding animals, and we had a whole variety of non-responders. And the non-responders then um, are added to by these incredibly strong responders. That brings the average to about 13. That was at 11 micrograms per day. However, what happens if you use more? And this was done by a fellow named Deutschen Angelov, this is an independent experiment. They can choose the animals much more strongly. So the BBB score uh, is at six. It goes with their injections of peptide at 500 micrograms per day, 50 fold more. Their animals get to a score of around 15, which is really, really remarkable. Nine point difference, which is very outstanding. Uh, very surprising. And here's some movies provided to me by a Deutschen. Here's the control rat, rat walking on the balance beam. Here's a control rat climbing up a ladder. That's what they do in the Angelo lab. And th so this is a six uh, on the BPP scale. So very little movement of the back limb. Tail is down. Hardly can use the back legs. Here's their, this is their movies. This is a treated animal after two months, really remarkable ability to walk and a remarkable ability to walk up a ladder. Watch this one. So cool. So what's going on? Um, there is a definite amount of serotonergic sprouting that occurs after injury. We did not see changes in the lesion itself, but we saw this bizarre serotonergic-like sprouting phenomena that was very, very, prevalent in the responders. If you block serotonergic function, some of the recovered behaviors went away. I'll show you what these things look like. Here it is, these lava lamp-like shapes uh, that occur in spinal cord injury. Now, this is acute injury. I'm gonna skip the next slide and talk about chronic and ask now uh, if you have any questions. Uh, so this is, this is the background. I'm gonna talk about spinal cord injury in the next uh, five to seven minutes. If there are any questions now, uh, please ask. Uh, hi, Dr. Silver. Uh, we have at least one question in the chat here. It looks like one that's maybe been answered. Uh, Hugo Kim asks, uh, is there any known local gene expression, local translation, in growth cone related to the addiction behavior of the axons? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, we haven't looked at genetic changes in uh, the messages for the Lyre family receptors. Uh, we don't know if those are, are increased. That's a very good question. But we really don't know at the genetic level what's happening in terms of this addictive phenomenon. But I'm certain uh, that it has something to do with either shipment of the receptor that's already there or increased production locally, perhaps, in the growth cone. Great. Uh, I actually have one myself as well, kind of relating to the stuff that was just gone over with the... Uh, PTP Sigma. So I was reading an article in Science you co-authored in 2015, and you mentioned a systemic cocktail to enable neuronal growth cones to bypass inhibitory components of the extracellular matrix. Uh, the article was specifically on epithylon B and its potential inhibitory effect on fibroblast migration combined with stabilization of microtubules. Could this, this new protein tyrosine phosphatase receptor inhibitor be an important component in that cocktail if we were to pursue that route? And then for that proposed combinatorial treatment, uh, what, if any, additional drugs would you consider utilizing? Right, uh, that's very important. So, of course, our peptide could be, I mean, that's what I'm gonna end with, my last slide. We'll say it's really important. 
to now combine other strategies with ours. Ours is easy to administer. Uh, it's, it's given systemically just by injection. So yes, epithelion uh, could be B, uh, could be useful. Uh, I'd like to see combination treatments with uh, physical therapy and or epidural stimulation. So the cocktail can get quite large. We are now focusing uh, on the fibrotic scar in, in our lab. And some of the molecules in the fibrotic scar, they can also be important. So I think it's going to be important to deal with both glial scar and fibrotic scar simultaneously. And we're, we're working on that. Awesome. Uh, I've got a question here from Stephen Crone. Uh, so is increase in CSPG found on both sides of the court after C2 hemisection or just the side of injury? Is the upregulation due to the injury itself or loss of activity slash input below the lesion? Right. Um, it's been reported. Well, we see proteoglycans on the same side, for sure, all the way up and down the side of the injury. Uh, there's also been uh, reports by Victor Evranian uh, that there's an upregulation on the good side. Uh, also, especially at nodes of Rambier, uh to change the, uh, the firing uh, uh, velocity of those axons. So it, it can increase on both sides and not the same. Um, most of the increase, of course, is on the side of the injury. Cool. Uh, I've got one more just kind of from the talk just now. And um, I know that you said that the, uh, so this is going back to that uh, PTP sigma. Uh, are there any, um, the receptor inhibitor, are there any negative uh, side effects to using that or has it mostly just been positive? Very important question. Uh, we really don't know if we give, I mean, we gave our animals peptide for two months. Uh, the there's a company involved, I'll, I'll give that disclosure last, uh, that have been uh, uh, treating uh, human subjects now for several weeks, uh, not months, uh, in phase one trial. And so far, fingers crossed, no, no, no apparent side effects. No loss of memory, no, ar no arthritis, which I was worried about. Uh, and sleep disorders, people aren't reporting it. So far, so good. Awesome. All right, I, so I, I, want to tell you about, I want to tell you about chronic injury, because uh, that's really cool. Let's, let's roll right into it. Yeah, so what about chronic? This, this is very tough. These are high risk, incredibly expensive uh, experiments. And I, I want to thank uh, my collaborators uh, who have helped me. Uh, work on chronic spinal cord injury started uh, by a really interesting, uh, I guess, let's call it an accident. Uh, Warren is a great guy. I know he's not listening to this now because he's doing something else. But uh, Warren had, had, had generated some C2 hemisections because he was interested in diaphragm function. Uh, we wanted to restore one muscle that I thought was really important. Wouldn't it be nice to restore the function of the diaphragm, especially if you're a quadriplegic? And so we, we focus on the C2 injury uh, and, and its effects on the hemidiaphragm on the same side. So if you make a lesion here at C2, you paralyze the ipsilateral diaphragm. It's called hemidiaphragm. It just paralyzed. If you do it right, this is paralyzed for life. If you do it right, if your lesion is complete. However, we know that there are some axons that are actually recrossing the midline, already present in the phrenic motor pool but they're sleepy, they're latent, they do not work. They're there, how do we know they're there? Well, if you wake them up by cutting the other phrenic nerve and you really wake them up because now you've got a lesion here and a lesion here, you are dying of anoxia and that's pretty stressful. So that stress releases lots of serotonin from the RAFA. Uh, it lowers threshold of activation of these RVRG neurons, which are the pacemakers, and this starts to breathe. I've seen it. It's truly remarkable. Also, I told you that the perineuronal net increases. It changes. So if we get is the net critical for causing these axons to be latent, right? Warren showed that you can wake these axons up pretty rapidly, especially if they're already asleep. I'll show you that. So let's hope, yes. So if a, if a neuron is already stuck and entrapped in the rim, making lots of the sigma receptor, uh, if you add chondroitinase, you can wake it up, even if it's already been stuck. Well, that's cool. So what we'll do is that we'll try to unstick them. We are going to affect not the scar. We're going to affect the ventral motor pool targeted to the diaphragm, which is the phrenic. And we would just simply inject chondroitinase in these animals 
uh, that Warren had forgotten. I mean, we have done this experiment before acutely after injury, and we didn't see any change. It was hardly effective. So if you make a lesion here and, and you acutely inject here at C4, you do this rapidly here, here, uh, we saw almost nothing. But in these animals that Warren had forgotten, we saw remarkable effects. And indeed, the effect on the diaphragm was robust, almost essentially normal recovery of EMG activity, but it took a lot of time to get here after injury. So if you treat right away, or even after just a week, you don't see much activity. But if you wait three months, maximal activity. You, and that increases the longer you wait. So if you wait a year and a half because of our mistake, and by the time it took to get Pippa Warren into the lab, it was about a year and a half uh, after injury. These were old, old paralyzed animals. And the diaphragm was completely silent, even a year and a half later. If we add chondroitinase, right, a year and a half after injury, you start to see recovery already, at probably even before one week, which blooms to almost essentially normal recovery of function. It was pretty amazing. A big increase in serotonin. I'll show you the diaphragm. I'll show you how it's working. Um, and actually see the muscle recover. So these are films of the diaphragm in control animals that have a hemi section. Now you're looking from the abdominal surface. This is just saline. This is the side that's good on the left, see so it's contracting. And this is the side, the hemi diaphragm that's paralyzed. It's being stretched to the left. Here's another one, right? We used intermittent hypoxia, but don't worry about that. See this membrane, it stretches. But if you give the chondroitinase and you wait a little while, then this diaphragm comes back. You can see it squeezing. And this membrane is stationary. It's really remarkable recovery. And what was really cool is that we not only saw some recovery of the diaphragm, beautiful recovery, indeed in most animals, especially if they were old, we also saw effects on the forelimb. Right? There was some recovery of forelimb behavior, even though we injected our animals at C4, which is the right region for the phrenic motor pool, there was probably some enzyme that kind of diffused caudally to the cervical enlargement, and we saw some recovery of hand function. So now I want to tell you about what we're doing now uh, on, for, on forelimb. And so this is a collaboration. So don't forget, we've got to wait at least several months before we get nice activity recovery of the diaphragm and of the forelimb if we use chondroitinase. So three months at a minimum, we would wait. The longer you wait, the better. Keep that in mind. The longer you wait and target chondroitinase to a particular motor pool, the longer you wait, the better the response in our hands. But this is a chronic spinal cord injury, and we're going to target hand function, arm function, not the diaphragm. We're going to make C2 hemi sections. We're going to wait three months, and what are we going to do? So I thought maybe a double punch. We would use our peptide to inhibit the receptor, but we could also inhibit the production of the perineuronal net proteoglycans themselves with the use of this drug called hymecromone. It's been around forever. It's 4-methylumbiliferone. Its job, or what it does, and it's been approved in Europe for many, many decades to pre prevent scarring in the bile duct. So, Jessica repackaged it at a higher concentration, and we call it perineuronal net inhibitor. And what it does is to block an enzyme called hyaluronan synthesis, which is the formation of hyaluronic acid, which is the backbone, as I told you already, for the perineuronal nets, which are attached to the proteoglycans, there's tenacin involved. And so without hyaluronic acid, no net. And so what we would do is to lesion the animals at C2. We create a brown sequart-like syndrome in the rat. We would wait for three full months and we would treat with one or the other or both to make our cocktail, all right? So this is another thing we've added to the peptide to help a double punch, inhibit the receptor and the synthesis of the proteoglycan 
This is work done by Jessica and my graduate student, Adriana Milton, who just submitted this paper. So we're trying to get rid of the net. This just shows that it works. I want to move quickly so you can see the movies. And I want to show you what happens to walking. So we use the Shumsky forelimb walking score. It's very much like the BBB scale, except it's for the forelimb. All right. Um, here's the normal animals, right, at around 17. Right, that's baseline. So it's a 18 point scale, right? You make a lesion, the animals drop down in their FLS score. But over time, of course, they recover a little bit. That's normal. That's what you expect. They baseline at around eight on the Shumsky scale, which I'll show you in a second. And that stays that way. However, animals that are treated with either PNNI, IS, or the combination all improve. And remarkably, this improvement starts to occur, although it's not significant, right away, just like the diaphragm. And then the best animals, the most consistently recovered animals, are the combination treated. And they, get, they can get to a walking score uh, that's pretty remarkable. On average, though, to about 11 or 12. Now, here's a movie of a control rat walking. So this C2 hemisection has a very strong effect on the diaphragm, but also on the left forelimb. You can see how the animals walk. They can move the shoulder, but they can't. It's very difficult for them to spread the toes. They, they tend to walk on the top of their foot. Just watch that. So that's an eight on the Shumsky scale, okay? Now here's a rat that's done really well. It's not our best rat. Really nice recovery. There's a lot of variability, but this, but they can, they can achieve really remarkable scores. So this animal is around a 16. All right, so humans, of course, people with spinal cord injuries want more than just gross ability to walk. Uh, they they want to use their fingers. They want to use their hands. There's very little work on hand function after chronic spinal cord injury uh, targeting uh, a biological basis of recovery. And so the same animals that we looked at gross behavior, we looked at forelimb function in the digits. Now, rats don't really have a proper thumb, they have kind of a nubbin, and they have really dexterous movements of the digits. They're remarkable, actually. Uh, and they love to eat cereal, like Fruit Loops. Uh, and so we test the animal's ability to eat a Fruit Loop or um, um, around like a Cocoa Puff, and you score them. You give them a score, and that's the so-called IBB scoring system, which ranges from zero to nine, so it's a 10 point system. And if you look at the control animals, right, on the IBB scoring system, they get to a score of about two. I'll show you the movies. Individually treated animals, unlike before in crude walking behavior, get a little bit better, but this is just a trend, it's not significant. But the very best animals are these that got the combination, right? So the animals start to recover slowly, they don't recover finger function so fast, and then they get to an incredibly high score in some animals. And I'll show you some of the highest scoring animals. So on average, they're the best. So they go from about a two, right, to somewhere around six with some real superstars. And I'll show you the last movies. So this is the this is a rat, normal rat. Eating, they love Fruit Loops at 50% speed. Watch the fingers, watch the thumbs, watch how the cereal is manipulated. So the fingers are shaped to the shape of the cereal and they make movements of the cereal while they eat it. That's typical of a normal rat. They love Fruit Loops. Now, here are two control animals with a C2 hemisection uh, and saline. So they, they can use the affected limb as kind of a, a cane, uh, but they can't use it to grasp the Fruit Loop at all. It always sits here. They can make subtle adjustments uh, that are very gross with the paralyzed limb, but they, they can't use the fingers. So, of course, that's a big problem. But they, you know, they love Fruit Loops, so they can use the good hand. All right, now I want to show you one of our recovered animals. This is not the best. It's pretty remarkable. So she's around uh, six or seven. 
you can see the shape of the fingers around the cereal, not exactly parallel. Is there something else I can help with? And there she goes, really nice recovery. Very exciting, really exciting. So what's going on? Basically what we're seeing is a serotonergic sprouting, which occurs, a reduction of the perineural net in the region where the serotonergic sprouts are occurring on the ipsilateral side, beyond that, which is on the control side, which has much more net. This is quantified here. So basically, loss of perineuronal net, even in the peptide-treated animals, keep in mind why. You expect it here, but you might not expect it there. And an increase in serotonin. What we have not found yet is the most obvious um, change that we'd like to see is some kind of sprouting of the cortical spinal tract, but we have not seen that yet. So basically, uh, right as of now, we still don't know the exact anatomical substrate that's involved with this remarkable behavior, but it's gonna be exciting for the future. So to summarize Cajal, uh, he was pretty negative. He said, everything can die, nothing can be regenerated. And I've shown you today, I hope, that even long after spinal cord injury, there's a possibility of sprouting and or regeneration. Uh, the recovery can be remarkable. It could be due to uh, axons that have already sprouted and are sound asleep. And we'd like to combine our peptide with additional strategies so we can move forward with even more optimal approaches. I just want to report that uh, there's a clinical trial going on right now with the peptide. Uh, this company, NerveGen, has licensed our techniques, uh, our strategy, and has finished phase one uh, with pretty good success. So with that, uh, I'll end. And if there are any other questions, I'd love to take them. Awesome talk, Dr. Silver. A uh, few questions here. So first one I want to go over is uh, Mar from Maria Jose Metcalf. So the question is, is there a specific timing for treatment that can promote appropriate rather than aberrant connections with common approaches such as chondroitinase, chondroitinase combined with rehabilitation? So um, aberrant or unusual behaviors, right? That's what she's asking, mm -hmm. what's the optimal time? Uh, so we found that if it wasn't so much time, the, the longer you wait, at least in this hemisection model, the better the recovery. I keep saying that. That's likely due uh, to sprouting of axons that have occurred uh, during the waiting period. But those axons are completely smothered, their activity somehow by the net. So what's the optimal time? Probably the longer you wait, the more connections you get. Now, what's the optimal amount? Um, can you do too much? And if you read our uh, robust recovery of diaphragm function, uh, Pippa Warren's paper, we found that if you push the animals too hard, if you give chondroitinase plus intermittent hypoxia and you really drive the serotonergic system, you can get very abnormal, aberrant, spastic-like behavior. So you got to take it easy. You don't want to push too much serotonergic sprouting because you can get into serotonergic crisis. So exactly what the optimal time is and the optimal amount of rehab is, we still don't know. Perfect. <clears throat> so Liz Bradbury asked, um, could the pulling of the paralyzed diaphragm be causing some kind of plasticity similar to activity-based training, which might contribute to the increased response in the chronic spinal cord injured animals? Right. That's a very important, very important point. I mean, is the diaphragm is the diaphragm special? Now, I just told you that the fingers aren't so special. So if you wait three months, and they're paralyzed, uh, they've atrophied, and they can use they can start to use their fingers again, uh, and that and that hand has been just dragging along. Uh, it's being stretched as the animals walk. Uh, so that so those those muscles can rebound after three months, at least enough to pick up a piece of cereal. Now now the question. Uh, that Liz asks is a really critical one. What if you do something else to the muscle uh, that, that normally we don't do, except if you're a diaphragm, which is to paralyze one side, which now stretches the other side on every single breath. And that, and that stretching of the muscle may surely uh, have an effect on the nerve muscle junction uh, upon the ultrastructure of the cytoskeleton of the muscle itself. 
Uh, and I know Pippa Warren is uh, is very interested in the, in that uh, behavior. That's that's constant. You know, every breath stretch uh, could be very very special. If it is special, uh, it might be you know it might be important. To, and if we have a treatment to make sure people keep their muscles strong uh, after spinal cord injury, that that's basically what. That, and if stretching turns out to be one way to keep the muscles strong, so be it. That would be great. Perfect. Uh, Wolfram Tesloff asked, uh, he said, great talk. Uh, why is uh, the ISP reducing the perineural net? All right, that's an important question. <laughs> so um, we reported in a couple of papers an interesting downstream effect of the peptide. And one of the downstream effects of peptide administration to cells that have the receptor is the increased secretion and release of matrix degrading enzymes. So normally cells, neurons included, OPCs can slowly migrate across the net. They can sprout very slowly, even in the presence of the perineuronal net. And as they do that, they release a little bit of certain proteases that break down the bad guys, the inhibitory matrix. They release MMP2 or they can release cathepsins. And we showed that in the presence of the peptide, those enzymes that are normally made in low abundance are dramatically increased. So the peptide-treated growth tone is spitting out buckets of enzyme that's degrading of the net. So where the sprouting occurs, the net is also reduced. So in the presence of the peptide plus PNNI, we really didn't see you know, even more reduction, although we haven't analyzed things as carefully as we could. So production of specific enzymes directly directed to the inhibitory molecules. Interestingly, uh, the axons, at least in vitro, do not digest the laminin, just the pretty glycan, and away they go. Perfect. Uh, one more in the chat, and then I've got one. Uh, so this next one's from Megan Detloff. Yes. She says, uh, if you had to speculate, what tracks could be mediating the recovery of four paw function? Well. Um, we, we took a look at the cortical spinal tract, of course. Um, we're seeing it, and I'm not going to talk about it very much, seeing some interesting changes uh, in the inflammatory system in the CST, the dorsal one, dorsal medial. Uh, we did not see any regen frank regeneration across the lesion, and we did not see what I would call robust sprouting, uh, recrossing the midline. So what the substrate is, I just it, it could be it's it's likely to be some kind of proprio-spinal uh, relay network uh, that that has been set up and or uh, cortical spinal tract that we haven't we just haven't labeled strongly enough. So at the end at the end we, we just don't know. We're looking. Uh, and then one for me here, real quick. I think we've got just a second. So, um, are there any plans to apply the combined PNNI ISP treatment to a lower level contusion injury to study the impact of this uh, treatment on bladder activity and function? Uh, this would potentially expand on some work done in a 2015 paper in your lab, uh, laying at all. And then uh, you mentioned that 2018 paper, Rank, they also did some bladder stuff. So, yeah, bladder work. I didn't talk much about bladder today, but uh, there are well, my own lab. Uh, we're, we're studying a very severe contusive injury in both mouse and rat, very severe. Uh, the peptide by itself doesn't do that much. Okay. Uh, we, we are combining uh, our combination therapy, and we're also very interested in fibrotic scar, glial scar, uh, simultaneous uh, inhibition uh, uh, in, in that model. Um, um, for uh, the, in terms of bladder function and contusive injury, uh, there's a, a couple of labs around the world. I know Martin Udega uh, is very interested in contusive injury and bladder recovery, uh, and Kareem Fawad. Uh, he's also uh, looking at peptide in a contusive injury. So three labs that I know of are looking at uh, the role of this peptide and or combined with other things in contusive injury. And of course, anybody who's listening or reads these papers is, is welcome to add any injury that's more clinically relevant than the Brown support model. Awesome. That was a great talk. Thank you so much uh, for presenting today. Uh, 
I think uh, I just want to quick drop a note for May 2nd. We're going to have two presenters, uh, Dr. Anastasia Zarco and Dr. Homera Nawabi will both be presenting. So that's uh, a little, little less than a month away. And then I also wanted to mention that the uh, GRC conference, I think it's in Tuscany here, is also happening. And I believe there's uh, abstract deadlines coming up for that as well.